everybody, and welcome to this week's Cruise Chat. I'm Kathleen Penner, owner of Plenty of Sunshine Travel, and today I'm joined by Carl, and Carl's from Silver Sea Cruises, and uh, we're going to be covering the Arctic today. I met with him once before, so you can look back at our past episodes, and we covered in that one the Galapagos Islands and Antarctica, but today we're going to do the Arctic, and I'm super excited about it, so over to you. Thanks very much, Kathleen. It's always a pleasure, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to explain a little bit about the Arctic. I'm not going to go into too great a detail about any specific region, more so the Arctic in general, and just the time of year to travel and, and why one might consider going there, and how it's a little bit different going to the Arctic than anywhere else you might consider going to on an expedition cruise. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is, is show a quick video. While sailing on Silver Sea's first ever crossing of the Northeast Passage, I was struck by the incredible stillness of the Arctic Circle. We drifted calmly through pack ice as sunshine pierced the crisp Arctic air. From the top deck, we spotted two young polar bears in the distance. Time stood still, leaving me mesmerized as I witnessed these majestic animals exploring the frozen world of brilliant white ice and beautiful blue water. The polar bears captivated me entirely in their world of solitude, peacefulness and freedom. So a little bit of a teaser to get us started. Those polar bears look very playful. They look nice. Yeah, that was a, a young mother and her roughly year and a half old male cub. Okay. So that voyage took place in September of 19. So about a year and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. And it started in Alaska, <clears throat> excuse me, the Northeast Passage. So they started in Alaska and they went all the way over the top of Russia ending in Norway, about 25 days. They saw bears, specifically polar bears, on five or six different occasions. I forget what it was. That was one of them. And um, the biologists figured out that it was, a, again, a young um, female bear with her year and a half old male cub. He's probably long gone off and, and he lives on his own now or does his own thing. And she may well have more cubs. But uh, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of summarize or, or give it a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about the Arctic. So very often people will say it's anything within the Arctic Circle, and that's what this map is describing or, or, or sort of um, showing. And when you talk about it that way, within the Arctic Circle, you're talking about eight countries that... Um, that can that, that lie within the Arctic Circle. There's some question about Iceland. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of Iceland. You can see it just touching the Arctic Circle here. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, they're not considered one of the Arctic nations, but you know what the heck? We're not. Yeah, they're uh, so close. Goodness. Yeah. Splitting hairs here. Yeah. And and so the great thing and how the Arctic differs a great deal from Antarctica in a number of ways. If you look back, if you saw the, the video that we did on Antarctica and the Galapagos, or if you're somewhat familiar with Antarctica, you know that the, the vast majority of expeditions to Antarctica take place from the southern tip of South America. So there's really one main destination. There have been from Southern Africa, there are occasionally from New Zealand or Australia, but the vast majority depart from the southern tip of South America. So it's really one spot of Antarctica that you're going to. In the Arctic, we have voyages departing from Canada, from Greenland, sometimes from Iceland, from Norway, Finland and Sweden, not very much, but also from Russia and from Alaska. So you can get into the Arctic from a number of different areas. And it's different in every region that you go to and you would go at a different time of year. The reason that we saw in that video um, or the reason that voyage happened in September is because we wanted to go as late in the season as possible when a lot of the ice was broken up 
over the top of Russia, because if you went too early in the season, you would still have a lot of ice left from the previous winter. So you want to go late in the season. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of solar radiation, 24 hours of daylight for months and months and months. That's starting to break up that ice and make that a little bit easier. Conversely, if you went to see polar bears specifically, and, and there are a lot of voyages in this archipelago of islands called Svalbard, um, which belong to Norway and are about halfway between the northern tip of Norway and the North Pole. So this archipelago of islands you see between Sweden and Norway there, uh, or the name Sweden and Norway on the map. There, you want to go early in the season. You want to go as early as possible because the ice that forms in the winter will stay through June and July um, and bears want to roam around on ice, as you saw from that video. So you want to go to the, that part of the Arctic as early in the sailing season as possible. And when I'm talking about the Arctic sailing season, we're talking about perhaps late May, usually June, until maybe in, into the first or second week of October, but usually by the end of September. That's when there's plenty of daylight up here. That's when, again, in the early part of the season, you're going for bears, hopefully, and, and lots and lots of seabirds. The latter part of the season, there's more darkness, or you're going because the, uh, the ice has broken up. In the case of more darkness, you're hoping to uh, find northern lights, and we'll talk right. about that a little bit as well. Yes. Another significant difference in, in going to the Arctic is that it's very much like going on safari. Again, if I use Antarctica as a reference point, we know where the colonies of penguins are and we will return year after year and we will find that the birds have returned year after year to their nesting sites in Antarctica. In the Arctic, we're hopeful to see polar bear, narwhal, beluga, walrus, um, reindeer, Arctic fox, polar bears. We just don't know where any of them will be because they don't nest. They don't make one area home. The narwhal, the beluga, the walrus, they're primarily underwater. The walrus are the exception. And sometimes the males will haul out or the females and the, and the pups will haul out. And if we come across a haul out and we know where some of their more um, uh, popular haul, haul outs are, and it's you know a series of rocks where they literally haul themselves up onto the rock, We'll go there in, in search of them. The polar bears are constantly hunting and constantly moving. So it's very much like going on safari. If you've been to East Africa or Southern Africa, you get up early in the morning, you get in your Jeep, you go off looking for the wildlife when they're sort of waking up in the morning and, and, and starting their day. And then back to the ship in this case, lunch, a lecture, move a little bit, and then go out again in the later afternoon, see what the wildlife is up to. We have small ships with a very high ice class, which allows us to go into waters like these and push the ice aside and penetrate deeper into these fjords and these bays and these inlets, looking for the wildlife and looking for whatever we can find. So it really is an expedition. And you've got to have that sort of expedition mentality going into it that we just don't know what we're going to find, where we're going to find it, when we're going to find it, uh, or under what conditions. So uh, it, it, it's a great adventure. You need to go with an open mind saying we might not see this, but we're going to see that kind of idea. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And when we do find something, you know, we may have to alter our plans and, and we'll talk about that briefly. You know, if we come across a walrus haul out and there's a, a dozen male walrus hauled out and we weren't expecting to see them and it's lunchtime or it's close to the captain may call the kitchen and say, hold off for an hour. We're going to go and, and take the guests as close as we can to come and see these beautiful beasts and, and get these incredible photographs. Yeah, wow. Similarly with the Northern Lights, you know, this happened again, I think it was in September, uh, late September, but it happened around one o'clock in the morning. And so the vast majority of the guests, I would argue all of them were in bed yep. and the expedition team, the two or three people that were still awake had a very quick discussion do we wake the guests up or not? Mm -hmm. Well, of, of course you do, because you don't want to sit at breakfast the next morning and say, oh, you should have seen the Northern Lights last night. They were fantastic. So there's a PA announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, everything's fine. Nothing to worry about. But if you would like to see the Northern Lights, they're on beautiful display right now. Put your big red parkas on over your pajamas, put your boots on and come up to the observation deck and come and see this. So uh, again, it's very much an expedition. Go with an open mind, great sense of adventure. We just don't know what we're going to find or where we're going to find it. Um, similarly with bears, you know, if we find bears at five o'clock in the morning and someone's got their spotting scope or their binoculars and spots bears, 
there might be an announcement again and call down to the kitchen. Hey, breakfast is probably going to be delayed by about an hour. Here's what's going on. Then a PA announcement. We're waking you up a little bit earlier than we had planned, but it's because we've spotted a mother bear and two cubs. We're already getting the zodiacs in the water uh, for those who want to go out and get this early opportunity to go and see bears. So mm -hmm. again, it, it's very much one of those places where depending on the time of year you go, that will affect what you see and how you see it, um, depending which part of the Arctic you go to, different things to see. Um, the Arctic also differs significantly from Antarctica in the sense that there is the opportunity to, to have a bit of a cultural experience as well. In Antarctica, the only human inhabitation are the scientists at the research stations. And, but in Greenlandic, uh, in, in the Greenland part of the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic, you'll find Inuit communities. And so there's sometimes on some of the itineraries, we plan to visit the, itiner the um, communities, Inuit communities, and therefore have a bit of a cultural experience as well. Yeah. So the Arctic is, is fantastic for all of those reasons. The, the wide variety of experiences you can have, the choice between a, a purely natural type of visit and uh, natural history or a visit that includes the natural history and the wildlife aspect together with the cultural component of it. And you can literally um, cover the world. It, it could be the Russian Arctic or the Canadian Arctic or the European Arctic um, in Norway. So an, an amazing destination for a lot of different reasons. I think a lot of Canadians think it's in my own backyard. I'll get there one day. It's not as close yeah. to your backyard as you think. It's and there's a lot more to it than just the Canadian Arctic. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with the Canadian Arctic. It's beautiful, but you can experience it from a lot of different spots as well. Yes. So that's a very, very brief overview of, of the Arctic. Again, in general um, and, and roughly the seasonality of it and why it might be appealing to someone. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. You know, I like the idea that you're so open and they just delay things and say, look, we're going to experience nature at this point. Forget about the food. We'll get to that. I promise. <laughs> I know cruising, you know, food is a big part, but so is seeing the wildlife and seeing everything there. And that's really, really awesome that they do that. Yeah, 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 yeah it has to be. You know, we know that for the vast majority of the guests, this is a once in a lifetime thing. And, and the, mm -hmm. the amazing thing about the expedition team and the captains on board, they know that they haven't lost sight of that, even though they may have been to the Arctic 50 or 60 or 70 times themselves, or done that many voyages. They know that for these guests and the kids on board or this uh, older couple for whom this was a lifelong dream, this is their one and only time. And to them to see these walrus or these polar bears or an arctic fox or a, a couple of arctic fox kits playing in the high grass or something like that or to visit an Inuit community mm -hmm. is the first time ever and and so yeah we the, the wind the weather the waves the, the ice conditions um, the wildlife conditions all of those things factor in of course we're going to make sure you eat but yep. if we need to delay if, if we delay our visit to a village uh, we'll radio the village who are waiting for us. They, they, you know, very often they anticipate these, um, these experiences or these visits by us um, for a number of months. They can't wait. And, and, you know, sometimes it's a matter of us buying handicrafts from them and things like that, but the interaction as well, but we'll let them know, Hey, we've just come across this. So we're, we're still coming, but we'll be there in a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really flexible and very, very comfortable. You know, if you're familiar with Silver Sea, you know that it's it's expedition, but with a lot of comfort. You've got a butler in every suite uh, in all suite categories. You've got um, your mini bar and your bar stocked to your preference. Tell us how you want it stocked. We'll replenish it throughout all complimentary. The gratuities are all included. Mm -hmm. um, on this particular ship, the Silver Cloud and her sister, the wind that will be applying the Arctic waters as well. Four dining rooms to choose from. So a truly all-inclusive experience and a very, very comfortable one. So I explain it as adventure by day and comfort by night. You're coming back to this incredible Festival platform. Yeah. yeah, this beautiful floating luxury hotel to come back to when you're not. Now, how many um, guests does each ship hold? You said there's two up there? 
And how many? There are we... three that we use in the Arctic. One is the Silver Explorer at 144 guests. Okay. And she's got a nice class of 1A, so she can get really get into that thicker ice and, and probe a little bit deeper into the fjords and the bays and the inlets. This ship, the Silver Cloud, and her sister, the Silver Wind. Uh, the Cloud was refurbished in 2017. The wind was scheduled to be done in the fall of 20, mm -hmm. but given everything going on with the pandemic, it's been delayed. I yes. believe it's going to happen this fall, mm -hmm. late summer, and uh, then the silver wind will come on board as well. So the cloud operates at 240 guests when she's in the Arctic and Antarctica with 28 expedition team members. So that's, a, I think it's a, a one expedition team member to 8.1 or 8.3 guests. So a really, really low yeah. ratio. There are so many expedition team members running around and they're ornithologists and glaciologists and polar bear specialists and polar historians. There's always somebody there to um, ask yeah, questions everybody. of their, yeah. yeah. And lots of great lectures. The Something very quickly to touch on and a significant difference between expedition cruising and, and classic cruising. And by classic, I mean the Caribbean, the Med, on the bigger ocean going vessels. Mm -hmm. Because we're off the ship relatively early here, for example, in the Arctic, we may be off the ship by eight o'clock in the morning and not back until noon. And then out again around two and not back till six. The enrichment aspect of it is a huge part of it. And it's a busy, busy day. So there are no shows. There is no casino on board um, because usually by the time dinner's over and it's 9.30, 10 o'clock, 9, between 9 and 10, you might find a couple stragglers in the bar having one drink and then heading off to bed because mm -hmm. we're going to have a wake up call at 6.30 the next morning. So, yeah. but lectures uh, punctuated throughout the voyage as well. So that's a significant difference, very much a, a um, uh, this enrichment aspect of it, speaking with or having the opportunity to hear and speak with these uh, specialists and, and um, doctors and, and postdoc fellows and things like that, that are the, the specialists in their field, as opposed to the Broadway style show and the casino and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And, and most guests go with that in mind and they know, and uh, oh, okay. you know, they're willing to forgo that. For yes, a couple yes. of days. definitely. Because it's the ship isn't the destination where you're going mm. is so much more important. And I think that's Absolutely. a great way to focus on that. You know, you're more of a, a traveler, not a tourist, right? Exactly. So it's good to, to do it in that manner. So that's one of the ways, you know, I love to explore is to dive deep into the culture and to learn about it. And I think this is a perfect way to see the Arctic and to, you know, actually explore it. And I think that's wonderful. Amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for putting all that together. That's just phenomenal. I appreciate it so much. And My I hope pleasure. you have a great week, everybody. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, okay, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this week's cruise chat with Carl from Silver Seas. It's just fabulous to see how they take care of all their guests. They make sure that if there's um, some seals or some polar bears or something that's a little bit out of their way, they'll go out of their way to make sure that you see it. So they'll hold some breakfast or lunch or get you up in the middle of the night to see the Northern Lights. If you choose, you don't have to, but if, they, if you choose, you can get up and see it. Um, they just make, they go out of their way and they make sure that you have a wonderful, wonderful journey with them. And it was just amazing. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're going to be streaming this on your favorite podcast channel, in the bottom of the page on the description, you're going to see a link to the show notes page. And on that page, I do um, a, basically a blog post for each and every cruise chat that we do. And you'll be able to see some of the maps a little bit closer, some of the slides and some of the highlights, plus how you can get a hold of me. It's info at plentyofsunshinetravel.com. So you can always get a hold of me. Just click that link and send it on over. Next week, I'm going to be meeting with uh, Jennifer from Avalon Cruises. And Avalon is primarily a river cruise line, and they have those amazing panoramic suites. So I'm looking forward to meeting with them again, and we're going to be highlighting one of their itineraries as well, which is really great. If you want to get in on the conversation, you can visit us on Facebook and Instagram. It's Plenty of Sunshine Travel on both. And uh, get in on the conversation. I try to announce who I'm going to be meeting with so that if you have any questions, I'll be sure to present them to the person that I'm meeting with because I put out a new episode each and every week, um, usually on Thursdays around noon. So make sure that you tune in to our other social media channels and you can get in on the conversation. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.